Keith, we uh, we lost in basketball this week. I know. Well, that I've was, been sick with the flu. Yeah, it was a it was a tough one. Um, we'll get it back next time. So, for I mean, obviously been a legend in the space for a long time. But for those who don't know, can you please give a brief background of who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you are? Yeah. So I took the classic career path of becoming a lawyer, and then being a litigator, and like doing everything wrong. And then I was like 30 years old and decided to like jump out of the legal profession, uh, sort of without a parachute. Um, it was like February 2000, so like right at the height of the internet bubble. Um, so it was good advice, good career decision, but the worst possible time. So it was a little stressful for the first year when everything was crashing and burning. Jumped into this crazy company, it was literally crazy, called PayPal. Um, just Elon had just been fired. Um, Peter Thiel came back as CEO, and so I joined, and we went through like a two-year um, Rocket. Uh, and did you know it was going to be a huge company at the time? Or? No. It had four and a half million users, um, which is a lot. Um, and so it kind of had cut through the clutter from a brand perspective. But it was bleeding money. I mean, it was losing $10 million a month, um, which at, at that time, in 2000, $10 million a month was a, like a really high burn rate. Now, like, it's almost common. Um, but uh, in any event, no, it, it was a complete mess. Well, let me stop you real quick, because you just tweeted earlier this morning how a lot of people don't... Uh, follow Sheryl Sandberg's rocket ship advice, right. uh, which is essentially, if there's a seat on a rocket ship, something that's blowing up, get on it. And was, was PayPal a rocket ship for you, or, or how, how did you meet Peter? How, how did you know? No, I, it wasn't obviously a rocket ship. I was thinking at the time that, well, it's kind of this brand that people have heard of, so worst thing is if it crashes, at least it'll look decent on a resume. Because mm -hmm. like, the problem on a resume at the time, and it was literally a resume because this is before LinkedIn, is if someone doesn't recognize the company, it's really hard to assess you. And so I was a little nervous about that. But on the other hand, it, it, it had been in the Wall Street Journal and like four and a half million users is a decent number. And if you did a brand survey at the time, it was like the eighth most popular brand on the internet. Like so Google was at the time like number right. four, like, so it was like a long time ago. Um, so no, it wasn't obviously gonna be successful at all. I mean, the company was literally changing. We had three CEOs in six months. Wow. So that's usually a proxy for a mess. Um, but anyway, when Peter came back, he started fixing things. And we went from very unprofitable to profitable, filed a public offering like the RS1 to go public the day after 9-11, wound up trading and going public in February 2002, um, which is one of only three technology sort of oriented companies that went public that year, Netflix being one of the others. And then we sold the company. So in like two years, we went from a complete mess to an IPO to an acquisition. And then for, after that, Oh, after that, well, after that, everybody thought the consumer internet world was dead and done. Like, it's hard to even describe how much of, like, a nuclear winter was around, like, this Bay Area. Like, people thought technology was dead, and particularly consumer applications, consumer products, there was no future for. Um, un -fort or fortunately, a few of us disagreed. Like, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman particularly, really believed that there was a future for the consumer internet. And so they started investing in these crazy startups. And there was really nobody else giving entrepreneurs money at the time. So every entrepreneur who had a consumer idea sort of went to Peter and Reed and asked for money. And fortunately for them, it turned out that some of them were actually decent ideas. Um, some of them were potentially interesting ideas that crashed and burned, sort of like Friendster. Um, but there was another wave, and being at the front of the wave was a really good you know, investor or entrepreneur decision. And so that's sort of how like, my friends from PayPal sort of became fairly influential. It was sort of by accident. And what do you think was, at the time, was your core competency that they really wanted, you know, I needed Keith's opinion. I need Keith to be here and running this company with me. Back, back then, it was mostly the intersection of business and regulatory um, problems. So, you know, I'd been a lawyer. I'd been involved in politics as well. And a lot of payments particularly intersect with, like, all kinds of regulation. And you're just kind of trying to steer around it and navigate the gray area and trying to quarterback that stuff and keep all these evil companies like MasterCard and Visa from killing us and eBay from killing us and using law and regulation as part of that process was sort of my, my real skill set at the time. And then it broadened, like, over the last, like, 15 years. But that's what everybody wanted. So I had, like, 17 lobbyists, like, full-time, like, really busy um, in D.C., both offensively and defensively. The Patriot Act had just been passed, and at one point, the Treasury Department wanted us to collect a Social Security number from every buyer, which is insane. It would have really killed us. Um, so I had to stop that. So I had a lot of like these kind of problems. Um, and then learned to do corporate comms and biz dev and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so at this time, were you thinking, okay, my friends are about to start these huge companies. One of them is going to be a rocket ship. 
and, and, and let me join him? Or what, did you, what were you thinking this time? Yeah, yeah. So actually, Elon tried to recruit me to come down to LA to help do the regulatory stuff for SpaceX, which was obviously going to have lots of regulatory complexity. Um, and I didn't really want to move to LA. Um, I don't know if anybody <laughs> here. But anyway, I was interested. And then um, wound up getting involved in a whole bunch of cool new companies, like including LinkedIn, which didn't look like a rocket ship at the time either. It grew actually fairly linearly. I mean, in fact, a year and a half after the launch, it only had 1.5 million users, which for a social product, a viral product, is very, very low. Um, but it was always like growing. It just wasn't growing. You know, sort of, it never had this like exponential curve to it. Um, but it you know, had a monopoly characteristic, which is it was the only professional database um, that existed for normal people. And that's obviously very valuable. And so it's become an you know, incredibly important company. But it, was, it wasn't totally obvious, either when I invested or when I joined the company, that it was going to be like massively valuable. It was obvious that it could be pretty valuable. And you could say that uh, you know, if someone hits it once, it, it's luck. But you've hit it with you know, companies multiple times that, that maybe weren't obvious in the beginning, but you saw something in them. Uh, and you've also uh, you know, d uh, developed a skill to find kind of the underrated gems or, or the people before their stars. To, what do you look for in, in these people or these companies? And how, how would you keep picking winners? So the people stuff is different in the company side. Uh, people stuff, I'm actually working on a draft blog post about it right now because um, it comes up a lot. Like everybody who's running a startup wants to recruit people. So they always want to find people to recruit. They're super talented, but you're not going to be able to recruit all the people who've established themselves, who've already accomplished things. Like there's you know, 55 billion other companies trying to recruit the same people. So the part of the art, and this is the th thing Peter actually taught me at PayPal, was how to find people that are undiscovered yet. And you've got to be able to do that at scale if you're going to build a company from scratch. Once you get enough momentum and you're one of the top 10 companies in the Valley, you can recruit people with a magnet um, that have established credentials. But you've got to get there without that. And so I remember actually the first week I worked at PayPal going for a jog across the Stanford campus with Peter and Peter explaining this whole philosophy to me. And at the time, I had no idea how to do this, actually. In fact, I was actually pretty bad. Like when I would interview candidates and hire candidates at PayPal, I was 50-50, plus or minus, you know, some were bad, some were good. Um, and it was really actually interfering with my career. <laughs> um, people were noticing that I wasn't that great at hiring. So what I started to do is to recruit individuals from within the company that I knew were stars and that maybe were underappreciated because that's a lot easier task like when you're in a building to look around the building and figure out who's really good that people don't always notice and then recruit them to my team and then make the team look really good. And so that was the first technique was like figuring out people I was already working with who is going to be particularly good, which is also what led to a lot of good investments was a lot of these people started companies and I was like, oh, can I invest? Um, then over time, I got better at figuring out what, was the common, what were the common denominators of those people and try to project that in interviews. Um, all, you know, a lot of the best people I've hired, almost all the best people I've hired, went to fairly random universities with non-technical backgrounds that had never worked in startup world before, and they're all like 21 to 23. Um, so you, it's a little bit like drafting athletes, though. You're going to be wrong a fair right. amount of time. Like you know, it's first round draft picks. You hope that you're picking a future star, but you're going to be wrong. It's not zero defects. Like anybody who tells you it's zero defects is, isn't hiring fast enough. And is it, uh, are there personality traits yeah. that you're also looking for? The best blog post is what Paul Graham wrote. Um, like it's called Relentlessly Resourceful. Um, I think that's the single best blog post on recruiting like, people for a startup. I think there are other characteristics, but if you had that, you can build off of that pretty well. There was one example you were telling me uh, where something to do with uh, smoothies do you uh, yeah, the smoothie story. Um, so yeah, this is sort of online at the moment. So I had an intern at Square um, who um, his first day at work um, was like, well, what should I do? And I was like, shadow me around and we'll find some stuff for you to do. And I'd been frustrated because people were working really hard back then and you know, engineers and product managers and designers would be in the office way past 9 p.m. all the time. And I wanted to kind of reward them. And you know, alcohol is not the best thing to reward people with if you want them to do work. And pizzas, actually, which is the common default in a startup, isn't actually very good for you either. And it makes you tired. And so I was like, what could we do? It's like, well, we'll get really fresh, cold smoothies. It's like healthy, cool. They're expensive. A lot of people don't like to buy them because they're so expensive. But we could never get the office to coordinate getting cold, tasteful smoothies to arrive at 9 p.m. sharp. Like something would always go wrong. Either the smoothies would be really bad because the people, the companies that would deliver those weren't the really top end smoothie places or they would shut down before 9 p.m. Um, they wouldn't show up cold. They would be delivered to the wrong place. And so like the whole point of having a, a treat for people just never, it always backfired. And smart people were struggling. These are smart problem. people. Like I had, the, you know, our office manager was very good. My EA was very good. 
other people were very good in the company, but they just couldn't make this happen. So my intern's like, uh, you know, what can I do? And I'm like, well, you know, I'd really love to have like smoothies show up at nine o'clock and put them on this table where the engineers work. And he's like, oh, I'll make that happen tonight. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, there's no chance in hell this is going to work. Like literally, no, there's no chance. And so then nine o'clock shows up, and lo and behold, on this table, there's a bunch of smoothies, all perfectly arranged, the variety of right, different flavors from one of the top tier places. And all the engineers are thrilled. And I'm like, wow, like, <laughs> this guy's got a future. Um, so the point of this is that what you actually want to do is start with all your employees, a fairly mundane task. And the people who thrive at it, you just increase the complexity and sophistication over time, like every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year until they show they can't handle something. And so you can find people in pretty random places that show this propensity of getting stuff done successfully and then constantly give them more and more complicated tasks. And those are the people you build the company around. Perfect. We're talking about people. Now let's talk about companies. We explain more about your tweet today, you know, Cheryl Sandberg's quote about finding a rocket ship. But specifically, what can people do to locate rocket ships, perhaps before they're rocket ships, or talk more about that advice. Okay, so you know, Cheryl, Cheryl famously talked about this, actually advice she got from Eric Schmidt when she was considering joining Google, which is, if you find a rocket ship, don't ask what seat, just get on the rocket. Um, and I generally think that's the best career advice for people is if you find a rocket ship, you want to get on the rocket, and then all rockets have so many things going on, like per the smoothie example, any high growth, high velocity startup, there's always new problems, and you can't hire people fast enough to solve the problems. So there's so many, there's so many opportunities to grow. If anybody has any ability in a company that's a high growth company, you just throw more and more problems at them, and they wind up with like you know this career trajectory. That's basically what happened to me at PayPal. I started with this little one major project, which is keep eBay from killing us. Then and it was like, keep Visa from killing us, then keep MasterCard from killing us, then keep the government from killing us, then keep the state governments from killing us. Then, then you know, we don't like our PR strategy, fix that. Then we don't like our business development strategy, fix that. And it's just constantly like new things that Peter was annoyed with, he just throw them at me. So I think that's generally quite good advice. The hard part is picking the rocket ship. Now, if you wait, when things are obvious, that's a good choice. Like, so when Cheryl joined Google, it was pretty obvious it was going to be a rocket ship um, to anybody who like had access to their metrics. If you go early, I don't think it's a good idea. Like, I don't think it's a good career decision to try to pick a rocket ship before it's a rocket ship. I think like we do that. You know, the best people who do what I do are right maybe 30% of the time. That's like a Hall of Fame batting average for an investor is to pick a rocket ship. So that's a bad idea for most people to try to do. I think you should pick your boss. Like pick your boss, meaning like someone you can learn from. Assume the equity value is zero, like literally zero, and say, would I learn enough? Would I enjoy this enough that I would do this job even if the net economic benefit to me was zero? That's the best thing to do, unless you're going to find a rocket ship and have an opportunity to something that's clearly established as a rocket ship. So it's like almost, yeah, completely different advice depending upon whether it's an established company or an early stage company. And what about a company that is really hot? but uh, isn't, you know, isn't pulling huge revenue. It's still somewhat unproven. Uh, let's just say, let's say Product Hunt, for example. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you know that it's a uh, it's legit rocket ship or going to be a rocket ship uh, and not just, you know, hype? I, I, you can't as an individual employee. Like, I think, like, you're kidding yourself. I think you can pick, do I like the people? Yeah. Will I learn a lot from these people? Would I, would I be willing to do this for four years even if I had no equity value? And if so, then it could be a good decision. If you're counting on the equity value being worth anything, it's a bad decision. Right. No, that's interesting. Way Not that your equity value, yeah. but <laughs> no, it'll be worth a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and even if you're the the 30th employee or the 50th employee, we're hiring. By the way, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, we're hiring too. By the way, Kosla, open. Well, Kosla too, but Open Door. Talk about Open Door. Yeah. So Open Door allows you to sell your home in 30 seconds online. So there's actually an idea I had back in 2003 to show you how long sometimes things take. And you can just input your address and we'll buy your home from you basically sight unseen. So you can move out and have your cash in three days. So if those of you may own in a home or have ever tried to sell a home, it takes about 84 to 90 days to sell your home in most parts of the United States. And about 20 to 25% of the people who list their homes never actually sell them. Um, so it doesn't even completely close. It's a painful process. It's an expensive process. It's time consuming. You have to paint your home mow the lawn, clean up stuff, like, you know, maybe even move around the furniture. And so we take care of all that for you, and we're live in Phoenix. Um, we've been doing pretty well. We're hiring lots of data scientists, if you know any of those, some engineers, some business people. And out of all the companies you could be working for and working with and starting, why, why this one? 
Well, so residential real estate is a massive, massive market, and it's been basically unaffected by technology. This was true in 2003, which is when we started thinking about this idea. It's the biggest market in the world that's been unaffected by technology. There are things like Zillow that have had some effect, but barely changed the way people, the process of buying and selling a home in the United States. Um, but if you're right, like trillions of dollars move per year. So 5.75 million Americans sell their home every year, despite all the friction and expense. Um, real estate agents earn about $76 billion worth of fees per year in the United States. So it's just so massive. It's so illiquid and so painful. Anytime you can add liquidity to a massive market, it's usually quite successful. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that, is that you've been in the tech game for years. <laughs> and years and literally decades before it was cool. And before it was hip and before it was kind of penetrating mainstream culture. How, and now we see kind of, kind of convergence of Hollywood and Silicon Valley and just everyone's wanting to get in the, in the, in the game. Seeing as you're one of the, you know, been since the beginning, how, how do you think about that? Well, I think it has it's had some good effects and some bad effects. The good effects are obviously like, you know, software and technology can change the world. It can change the world for good. It's probably better that people spend their time in software and technology than in financial services and on Wall Street, as an example. However, there's the Hollywood version of startups, which is like, oh, everything's going to be easy. This is going to work out. You know, we're going to make a lot of money. This stuff's are actually really, really, really painful. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you need such an adrenaline rush is you have to offset all the pain. And you go through this like ebb and flow, and the ebb and flow, the sign curve is you know, sometimes every hour, sometimes every day. Maybe you get it to every week, but it, it's pretty painful. And so I think that the celebrity culture side uh, over the last, I don't know, six years is actually pretty bad. Um, and it attracts maybe the wrong people with the wrong motives to some extent. And how do you think moving forward as tech kind of plays an even bigger role in kind of mainstream culture that will affect uh, politics or government? I don't, don't know. Eventually over enough time there's an arc of history. Like, you know, like there are like these long arcs of history and eventually the, the, right, the right result occurs eventually. And I think over time, technology and innovation will, then, will apply to government and decision making, but it usually lags by years and years and years, sometimes decades. So there's a long arc of history that quote unquote bends towards justice, is you know, the famous quote. I think that's true. It's just not, you can't accelerate that necessarily. And how ultimately, uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, even longer, how do you judge your success? Um, mostly on people, um, you know, people that have, Gone, <laughs> been <laughs> unfortunate enough to work with me <laughs> and learned a lot really fast. Um, and what do, what do they wind up doing with their lives? Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully they've made a big difference. So far, so good. But yeah, it's like working through people. Like it's the best part of being an investor too. Is yeah. you get to work with all these cool, talented entrepreneurs every day. It's almost like being a psychologist. Like you sit right. literally all day long. It's just sitting on a sofa like this. Some entrepreneur walks in your office and you're like, uh, so tell me your problems. Yeah. And then you have a conversation. Well, have you thought about this? Have you tried this? You know, blah, blah, blah. Hopefully we don't prescribe any drugs. But basically, <laughs> it's just like having a psychological you know, therapist. And what do you think, uh, as this becomes more common, what do you think education is going to look like? That's another one that like, seems to you know, ignore the arc of history for <laughs> long <laughs> gaps of time. But um, I think education will be radically different. I have yet to find a specific formula to invest in. Um, I, I tend to believe that credentials matter more than people realize. And so it's not just substance. You have to have an innovation on both the credential side and the substantive education side. And most companies have attacked one or the other. And I think someone will figure out how to cleverly fuse together a new credential, a new brand that, that conveys certain things. Like, so for example, a lot of the reasons why people go to Stanford is the perception. It's right. not what they're gonna learn there, even though they won't admit that publicly. But I think to break through in education, particularly higher education, you need to couple the perception with the reality that I actually am smarter, more thoughtful, more capable of doing X, Y, and Z. And there's a perception that that's true. Are you excited about Minerva or uh, any other tech companies that you're particularly in alt school or make school? Or? I don't know if any of them are quite radical enough. I mean, Mervana is kind of cool and interesting and um, it's intriguing because it is ambitious. Um, and capital intensive, and so right. they're not being, you know, they're not being whimps about it at all. Uh, most of the online stuff, I think, is great for society. I.e., like there are tools and resources out there to learn anything you want. Like, for example, I was trying to learn a lot for a variety of other reasons. I was trying to learn a lot about cancer, and so I can go to Khan Academy and actually learn a hell of a lot yeah. 
uh, about cancer go pretty deep. Like it was shocking. It was shocking to me as someone who hadn't really tried that before of like how deep in substantive knowledge you could get so that you could have an, a pretty serious conversation with people who are experts with just by studying, you know, a few videos over like 10 hours. Perfect. And we, uh, one last question. This one's from the audience. Uh, describe a day in our life or, or maybe your life, you know, but the average, the average you in, uh, in 10 years, how is technology going to change someone in, you know, your situation Oh, wow. In 10 that, years. That's really tough. So, I mean, I should actually feign, like, I should, probably shouldn't answer this question. So, I am mostly, to be clear, like, what I'd call bottoms-up investor, meaning, like, it's, I think it's my job to have entrepreneurs explain to me the future, and then I sort of triage whether I believe that that's, like, a plausible, you know, outcome, whereas a lot of investors, including, like, some of my partners, are very much top-down investors, and they have a strong view about the future of the world. And then they go look for opportunities that are consistent with that view. So this stuff is really hard for me because that's not just generally not how I think. That said, what I, what I do believe is that the continuing trend of math replacing humans will displace humans in almost every field. So for example, we talked about Open Door, which is really replacing human judgment about what a home's worth, either your, home, your, your judgment or your real estate agent's judgment with like a machine. In healthcare, which is even more radical, I actually totally believe that doctors and human ex doctors are just as foul fallible as every other human expert, and that one day you won't talk to a doctor in terms of getting a diagnosis or for treatment. There'll just be some machine that calculates what you should do, and that's actually happening sort of under the surface right now. Um, that'll happen in every single field. Like I have an investment in the legal profession that one day maybe starts drafting briefs for you based upon what the most likely, you know, best rebuttal is so that humans don't really do much work. They do 1% of the work in the machines and math do 99%. And that, that'll be true in all parts of our society. Self-driving cars, just as an obvious, easy example. How do you fix the loss of jobs? Don't, don't know how. Um, it's not... Space? Sorry? <laughs> Space? Mars? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the next Elon project. Um, the, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not an easy problem. I think like if you looked at uh, one of the more thoughtful pieces, uh, Sam, Bal Sam Altman wrote a blog post recently about that and some of the implications and what technology changes tend to do to jobs. And it may take a while for that to shuffle, shuffle through the system, but it's not like you can just prescribe a formula from above and say, yeah. here's the future of everybody's jobs that are displaced by math. Right. Perfect. This has been a fascinating chat. Please, everyone, give it up for Keith. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.